So that's it. We will start now. I am uh, very pleased to welcome you all. So good afternoon, everyone. I am the incoming president of CE Plus, the contracted independent organization representing the students and candidates in the doctoral program in a constructed environment here at University of Virginia School of Architecture. I am joined by my colleagues, Luke Hamill, Lincoln Lewis, and Julie Malika also uh, trying to get in and who are representing the program. It is, as I was saying, my great pleasure to welcome you to this academic year's last session of our spring speaker series and introduce today's lecturer, Carla Gonçalves. Carla is a good friend of mine. We met a few years back while studying landscape architecture at the University of Porto in Portugal. However, that is not why Carla is here today. In addition to being a trained landscape architect, Carla is a bright scholar and educator whose analytical mind I deeply admire. Following her education in landscape architecture, her interests in territorial planning led her to extend her studies, earning a Master of Sciences in Regional and Urban Planning from the University of Aveiro also in Portugal. She's now a candidate in the doctoral program in spatial planning at the University of Porto, integrating the Research Center for Territory, Transports and Environment of that same university. But before being fully committed to her doctoral research, which by the way is funded by the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology, Carla taught for many years in the Department of Landscape Architecture at the University of Porto, where we met again this time not as students, but as educators. And soon enough, she became a personal reference for me for her commitment to comprehensive and rigorous research and also the education of our students. Between 2018 and 2021, she was elected board member and treasurer of Civilscape, the international network of civil society organizations and local and regional authorities working on landscape management, planning and protection across Europe. Today, she asks, what is coastal landscape governance research saying? She will offer insights gathered from a systematic literature review on the related theoretical debate and introduce us to her manifesto, which will soon be published. Carla lecture will take about 40 to 45 minutes, immediately followed by a short Q&A session. So please feel free to type your questions in the chat box or raise your hand during the Q&A session, and we will allow you to ask it or ask the, those questions directly. Carla, thank you so much for joining us. I will hand it to you. Hello, everyone. And thanks to my good friend, Bernal, for that lovely introduction. I am grateful for the opportunity to have shared and to continue to share our personal and academic journey together. So first, uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, Oops, sorry, no. So, uh, okay, so then, yeah. Yeah, all good, thank you. So first, uh, I want to uh, express uh, my gratitude to the School of Architecture, the University of Virginia, and to Bernardo, uh, Luke, Lincoln, and Julie for inviting me to participate in this C plus discussion series. Thank you very much for having me. And thanks to the audience for joining us today. And as Bernardo said, uh, I'm a PhD candidate uh, on spatial planning at the Faculty of Engineering and at the Research Center for Territory, Transports and Environment at the University of Porto where I'm conducting my research supervised by Professor Paul Pino. And I'm very excited to share some of my insights with you today on coastal landscape governance. And thank you again for joining me. And even though we're not in person, I'm looking forward for our discussion uh, on your own ideas and your own research on coastal landscape governance. And before I begin, uh, let me give you a brief overview of what you can expect today from my presentation. 
So first, I will be explaining why I have decided to do research on coastal landscape governance. Then I will introduce you to the concept and I will move on to explain why I have decided to write a manifesto in the first place. And lastly, I will conclude by presenting you my manifesto for coastal landscape governance. And through these points, I hope to provide you with valuable insights into coastal landscape governance research panorama, but also I hope to make a clear statement why we must reframe the relationship between landscape governance and coastal governance scientific debates. And why have I decided to conduct uh, research on coastal landscape governance? Well, depending on our, our background, our cultural context, our training, our experience, uh, some landscapes attract us more than others. And the reason why I have chosen the coastal landscape is strongly related to my personal, academic and professional experience after 15 years of landscape planning practice in Portugal. And this image that uh, are part of my that you are now seeing are part of my childhood landscapes, and they are one of the reasons why I decided to focus on coastal landscapes. Okay, maybe this is not the best video, but uh, I filmed it very recently when I was arriving to Porto, so I think it's a good way for you to partially experience my own landscape. And um, besides uh, of the, of these landscapes being I have an emotional connection to them. And besides my background in landscape architecture and my experience on teaching and practicing landscape planning, the other reason is related uh, to my collaboration on the coastal zone management plan for the north region uh, of Portugal that you can see its location here on the right side, which has been reviewed uh, three or four years uh, ago. And Despite all the landscape transformation that have occurred during the last 30 years in the Portuguese coastline, especially after Portugal's accession to the European Union in 85, and all the evolution of the scientific debate on landscape research since the first plan was made in the 90s, the role of landscape still seems to be secondary. And today, to the climate crisis, the main goal of the Portuguese Environmental Agency is to address coastal erosion and sea level rise, from a risk adaptation perspective only. And of course, this is relevant. And of course, that since the 90s until today, the paradigm uh, has shifted from uh, art engineer solutions to the soft ones, but at a holistic perspective of the biophysical, the cultural, the aesthetic, the social economic and the political values and their relations across time and scales are not uh, really considered in planning for the future. And that raise, raises the question of what kind of landscape do we want and whether is it possible to achieve it? Especially how, because most of today's problem, they are governance problems. And with sectoral policies involving many institutions and actors, problems are not limited by jurisdictional boundaries. So we must rethink how to deal with the social ecological boundaries instead of being driven by political boundaries. And another relevant aspect is that in Europe, we have a political framework that has been changing policies in research for the last 20 years, which is the European Landscape Convention of the Council of Europe. I'm a huge fan of it, and DLC is one, also one of the reasons why I decided to focus on governance. For those who might not be aware, the European Landscape Convention is the first international treaty exclusively focused on landscape. And nowadays it has been ratified by 39 European and non-European countries. And this convention aims to promote the protection, the management and planning of landscapes from a holistic perspective, highlighting the roles of citizens in decision making because citizens are also one of the makers of the landscape. The convention established several measures to achieve this goal, and Portugal, who is a signatory country since the year 2000, should be promoting collaborative landscape policies and integrating landscape into all relevant legislation and sectoral policies, approaching the concept of landscape as a holistic concept. However, in reality, this is not really happening as it should be, and the landscape is mainly addressed as a visual or aesthetic value. Another reason for choosing the governance of landscape as my research topic 
is that I collaborated as, uh, with the NGO Cyclescape, as Renard said, and here I had the opportunity to see the relevance of involving citizens and different stakeholders in landscape matters. And this was also quite relevant for my thinking evolution because I truly believe that landscape has the power to reinforce the democratic values and that through co-production, we can produce a better and more just policies, despite all the challenges that we may face doing that. Uh, along with the elaboration of my master thesis 10 years ago on how to integrate the European Landscape Convention into the Portuguese uh, spatial planning system at a local scale, I also discovered the Landscape Observatory of Catalonia. And for those who are not aware of this observatory, I suggest that you find it online because uh, they are really inspiring and uh, they have developed and created an international research uh, center and advisor for the Catalan government for technical research on how to integrate landscape into policies. Also, pursuing a PhD in spatial planning at the Faculty of Engineer under the supervision of Professor Paul Pino, who is a rock star, you are the professor, and I need to say this, uh, I, I'm really inspiring of, 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 of working with you. And uh, this possibility of being at the Faculty of Engineering and working with him has also equipped me with the uh, scientific methods and tools and knowledge required to use the theoretical and empirical evidence to contribute to the, land, to the landscape scientific research in general, and but also to landscape architecture specifically. And I am to explore its relationship with other disciplines to reinforce its value from a scientific perspective. And although landscape architecture is a design profession, I think it must increase its position in the scientific debate. Our competences can make a difference when interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary knowledge production is necessary, especially to address the challenge that we are now facing regarding the future. And later, as you will see, all these influences and intersection of my academic, my professional, scientific, and advocacy roles were fundamental when I was writing my manifesto for coastal landscape problems. Because although it is based on a scientific debate, it is very, uh, very ideological text. And when I uh, uh, and then I, when I began my PhD, I. And after I realized that I wanted to focus on coastal landscape governance, I started to explore the scientific database scotch. And I realized that I couldn't find any article, any, any scientific article under the string coastal landscape governance. So I decided to explore the relation between landscape governance and coastal governance. And I have conducted a systematic literature review using PRISMA 2020 protocol, exploring both debates, trying to identify potential theoretical and empirical islands by incorporating the landscape governance lens into coastal governance. And to accomplish this, I reviewed 174 articles. That was quite an insane. But in order to analyze how the coastal and landscape governance debates evolved on scientific publications. And also, I assessed which were the main trends and areas of discussion in both debates. And I have identified several research gaps to be further uh, explored. And my article has been already published on sustainability science, which is a Springer scientific journal. So I put here the link if you want to read it later, or if you're university, I can put in the chat room later. Uh, and if your university doesn't, does not have access to it, please, you can email me and I can share it with you. And our, our review, uh, demonstrated that both debates are very recent. So coastal governance debates could be traced back to 78, okay, because of the United States Coastal Zone Management Act of 72. But substantial uh, growth in the scientific literature on this topic only took place after 2007. Uh, regarding landscape governance, we also found that the concept was only introduced for the first time in 2007, when Goch, a German researcher uh, discussed the advantage of the landscape concept to move forward environmental governance specialization in Germany. 
And Gorg claims that we must recognize the politics of scales. Okay, so we are talking about multi governance, uh, which, according to him, raise concerns uh, not only about intersections between the existing levels of decision making, but also about the constitution of the various levels of themselves and also the relationship that they have with each other. Uh, so we must reconnect this multi level governance, the politics of scale, with the natural conditions of places. And to do so, we need landscape governance, which evolves from environmental governance, but being but is based on landscape concept and allow us to work with governance specialization. And governance specialization refers to the process of applying the governance principles and policies to a specific landscape. And this involves considering the particular natural, social, cultural, and economic conditions of each landscape and developing tailored governance solutions accordingly. From a conceptualization perspective, both debates, the coastal and the landscape governance debates, they may be interpreted from different perspectives, okay? So some authors, they focus on the discussion of the structural components, meaning the, lands, the, the laws, the policies, or the procedures while other authors focus on the process itself. So they were much more interested in the actors and their power relationships. While others focus on governance as a theory, so a set of hypotheses to be tested, investigated or revised. And uh, regarding the landscape uh, coastal governance operationalization uh, and landscape governance, they are strongly related to management approaches. However, while coastal, landscape, coastal governance mainly addresses integrated management, ecosystem-based management, and land sea conservation planning, landscape governance is discussed in relation to integrated landscape approaches. And integrated uh, landscape approaches have become a driving paradigm in the international environmental realm during the last decade, okay, mainly in the global south. And some authors recognize that landscape governance is still a very recent concept, while integrated approaches, mainly related to the coastal zone, they have a long tradition, especially after the EU conference in 92. However, uh, several authors in the literature, they discuss the landscape approach as the next generation of integrated approaches. And why? Because landscape approach aims to conciliate conservation, conservation with development at landscape scale, based on the premise that trade-offs must be identified, negotiated, and accounted for. Because in any planning situation, there will always be winners and losers. And a relevant aspect is that uh, coastal governance, uh, theoretical and, and empirical research has been strongly influenced by the global north perspective. So main, uh, the majority of the case studies, they are located in the United Kingdom, Australia, in the United States or Canada or in Germany. So the, those countries are leading the discussion on coastal governance debate. On landscape governance on the other side, the discussion is much more related with forest landscape restoration, mainly on the global south. However, researchers are mainly based on the global north. And this is because several international institutions like the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the ICN, or the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United States, they, are, they have been advocating the landscape governance and the landscape approach relevance to meet the societal challenge that we must face. And during my systematic literature review, I found several research gaps, but of course I cannot be approaching all of them, otherwise we will spend the rest of the afternoon here. But the most relevant one, and it was the one that I decided to pursue on my PhD, was the fact that the scientific debate on coastal governance or landscape governance barely focus on coastal landscapes. So I concluded that there is a lack of theoretical and empirical knowledge on coastal governance debate. And so my PhD research aims to explore to what extent can coastal landscape governance contribute to the governance of the coastal system. And okay, little it's known on scientific debates about how coastal, coastal landscape governance has advanced in relation to coastal governance. However, 
uh, it is crucial to have in mind that despite the scientific debate has not approached the conceptualization or the operationalization of this concept, of course, there might have been elements of coastal landscape governance that have been already integrated into the coastal government policies, especially because of the concept of coastal planning or coastal management. Uh, the governance concept, uh, I'm not, uh, if you, uh, probably you are aware of this, the governance concept is much more recent, okay? It only appears in the early 80s due to neoliberalistic uh, policies in the United Kingdom, and uh, it has only gained a relevant position in the global debate after the 90s. So uh, we, we, we change it from the government perspective only to the, this concept that aims to describe the changes in, in the interaction between the government, the market, and the civil society. And this is probably the, the reason why uh, both debates, landscape governance and coastal governance, only had substantial growth in scientific literature after 2007. Be and uh, because before that, it was probably related to coastal planning or coastal man management. And however, I haven't conducted another systematic literature review yet. Uh, I have explored the uh, Scopus database with these concepts, coastal planning and coastal management, and I have explored their relation to the coastal landscape. And the majority of articles uh, that I've found only addresses outstanding coastal landscapes, or how to preserve coastal landscape static value. And of course, this is more relevant. I'm not saying that it's not, but it's not enough. So we must influence the scientific debate to approach the landscape concept as it is conceptualized today. And it's important that uh, you understand that governance involves the constant coevolution between the governance system where the planning and management system are integrated and the system to be governed. And there, of course, their power and knowledge relationships. And for that reason, government, governance is indissociable from planning and management. So any effort to trace coastal and landscape governance evolution must al also analyze and discuss its relationship with the planning or with management institutions and actors. So in my research, and of course, as a landscape architect, I'm mainly interested in the relationship between coastal and landscape or environmental institution and actors, and how they have shaped the coastal landscape over time. Additional, I'm also interested in how the evolution of the debate itself has been integrated into the policy system or not. Because if in the 60s, we wanted to protect the outstanding landscape, Today, as you know, we should be addressing all the landscapes, especially those where we are living in. So therefore, my research intends to explore the contribution of the coastal landscape governance for safeguarding and enhancing the coastal social ecological system. And to do so, I'm developing a case study research where I'm doing a revolutionary perspective in Portugal since the 50s on the governance system and on the system to be governed, the, the coastal landscape. And I'm assessing the role that landscape architecture thinking has produced in governance institutions, but also exploring a specific uh, landscape architect in Ribeiro Ujo and the plan that he has developed for the North region of Portugal in 78 for the coastal zone. And this plan was never implemented, but if it, it was, probably we would have a very different coastal landscape. And it has been quite interesting confronting the early Portuguese landscape architecture writing essays with today's coastal landscape governance debate. Because um, in my latest article, which is now under review, I confronted the Portuguese evolution uh, of its legislation with the international debate. And I demonstrated that to a policy discourse perspective, the evolution of coastal and landscape governance in international and European contexts has gone through four distinct phases, reflecting changing paradigm, paradigms. So we have evolved from the conservation awareness phase, which started in the 50s, uh, which focused on, a lo on local interventions with the primary goal of holding the coastal line. 
and we wanted to protect the outstanding landscape or natural areas to a sectoral approach and strongly influenced by the American wilderness model of protected areas. But then we move it towards the environmental movement and the demand for pollution control phase, which emphasizes a proactive regional scale approach that integrates environmental concerns due to the emergency of the sustainability concept. And as a result, the third phase, the emergency of the sustainable paradigm, has brought significant changes to coastal planning leading to the development of integrated coastal management, which recognizes that the national scale is the most appropriate level for managing the coastal zone. On landscape research, the significant milestones in this context were the inclusion of the cultural landscape category in the UNESCO Convention in 1982, and later in the year 2000, the adoption of the European Landscape Convention by the Council of Europe, recognizing the, le the relevance of all landscapes despite its, its historical or cultural value. And finally, we are at the current phase, which recognizes that the global scale interventions are required to address the climate crisis. And the discourse has shifted towards an ecosystem approach, emphasizing the need to recognize the boundaries of the coastal socio-ecological system so we must abandon the political boundaries to address the climate crisis. And also today there is an emphasis on planning and managing for all coastal landscapes. Also more recently, marine spatial planning has also gained a focus due to the international and European agendas. And as you know, soft engineering and nature-based solutions have become the dominant uh, in the coastal interventions, discourses, and practice, as well as the ecosystem service or the relevance of the blue and the green infrastructure, as well as adaptive governance and the resilience theory. But what does it really mean, coastal landscape governance, and which are the advantages of it from a theoretical point of view? So first, it's important uh, to have in mind that in the single coastal area, we might have different governance perspectives operating on the same time, okay? And a common aspect between all these concepts is that all of them rely on the governance concept. And as I told you before, the governance concept uh, uh, always involve addressing the governing system with the institution and actors and the system to be governed and, of course, their interactions. But what changes between different concepts is exactly their object, the system to be governed. And environmental governance object is the environment, which includes the water, the air, the soil, uh, the humans, the flower, the fauna, the flora, and their interrelationships. And all the other uh, concepts, they have evolved from environmental governance theory to address their specific object. So the coastal governance addresses the coastal zone and the coastal zone might have different uh, conceptualizations, but normally it is assumed as the band of dry land and the adjacent ocean space in which terrestrial process and land use directly affect oceanic process and uses. But coastal, the coastal zone boundaries are based on policy-oriented definitions. Landscape governance also is built on environmental governance. Yet, as I told you before, the literature discusses it as its specialization. And regarding uh, specialization, at least at the European level, this idea invokes the concept of territorial governance. Okay, because Territorial governance can also be considered the specialization of environmental governance. However, it relies on the territory concept, which is limited also by political administrative boundaries, or sometimes it relates with the place concept. But on the territorial governance discussions, the place concept is only an umbrella term for spatial formations beyond the formal limits. So the advantage of the landscape governance concept when compared with others is that relies on the landscape concept 
And the landscape concept connects both ideas of space as an absolute concept and place as an intangible and sincere value, working both as a social ecological system with a temporal spatial scale where democratic values are a central point. And in our manifesto, we are particularly interested in the formal definition presented by the Council of Europe because it states that landscape is an area perceived by people whose character is the result of the action and interaction of natural and human factors. And it assumes that all landscapes are equally relevant despite being outstanding or ordinary, recognizing that landscape is a social construction which depends on the dialogue around different perceptions and interpretations. And just one second. Along um, with this the landscape concept debate, uh, we also argue that the coastal landscape is more than a specific use adjective, okay? We are not assuming different land use types uh, to identify different landscape types. We are following the debate on landscape assessment based on the concept of a landscape unit. And the landscape unit is a concept that refers to an area that is characterized by a distinct set of ecological, social, cultural, perceptive, and symbolic features. So the concept of a landscape unit is important because it allows for a more holistic and a more integrated approach to landscape assessment and planning, which also takes into account the complex interactions between the different ecological, social, and cultural factors. And by identifying and mapping the landscape units, planners and decision makers can better understand unique characteristics and values of the different landscapes and also develop more target and context specific strategies for managing and conserve the landscape. So considering the confrontation between the different governance debates and building specifically on landscape governance discussions, we claim that coastal landscape governance is a place based multi-stakeholder process of negotiation and spatial decision-making within its broader institutional context, in which the civil society has the right and the power to influence the decisions on their landscape, aiming to create, to enhance, or to restore, or to create a new particular coastal landscape character and identity for the long term. So why a manifesto? When um, I concluded my systematic literature review, I started to wonder why was coastal landscape governance relevant? What was its added value when compared to other governance concepts? What could landscape governance bring differently to the coastal governance debate? So I started writing uh, another article, but in the end, I realized it, that I I, was, I had produced a manifesto instead, okay? It was based on scientific knowledge, but it has a very strong uh, per, and personal component, which uh, has depended on my own personal and academic and professional background. And uh, a manifesto, okay, I asked to ChatGPT, what is a manifesto? And the manifesto, aims to inspire change and to provoke action uh, when, by challenging the status quo and advocating for a specific vision for the future. And my idea was exactly this. I wanted to provoke action and I wanted to advocate for coastal landscape governance research and practice and in order to embrace two specific and interrelated crises. The first one is what Mark and Trop call it landscape crisis. And the landscape crisis is a concept that he uses to denote the feeling of discomfort that many people have because they cannot cope with the increasingly rapid change that are, they are experiencing in their landscape. And coastal landscape transformation occurs too fast and too sudden in many coastal countries, questioning their character and identity during the last decades. So today it's very difficult to find worldwide intact coastal regions. They are, they are rare, there are plenty of research on this. And uh, uh, today they are facing even more pressure due to the climate crisis. And of course that uh, worldwide concerns about globalization, landscape change, biodiversity loss, climate change and climate justice are central to many political agendas, demanding evolved forms of governance. 
and the climate change will exacerbate the landscape crisis. So we are talking about sea level rise, increased frequency and severity of storm, intensified coastal erosion, salinization, migration, the migration patterns will change, just to name a few. And all of this reinforces the need for an environmental, social and political reform that addresses the coastal landscapes beyond the political jurisdictional boundaries but also that uh, don't focus anymore on the liberal class battleground ideology, especially between the global north and the global south, okay? Because not everyone will be affected on the same way. And the disparities are expected to increase due to the different capabilities to implement climate change measures and the discussions on scientific level and on political level uh, are, uh, recognizing the need to establish a global climate reparations fund, okay? But we really need to rethink the way that power is exercised and our institutions are designed and we must be questioning and readdress it to produce political changes that benefit those who have been subject to accumulating disadvantage regarding their landscapes. And I think that landscape architecture theory can contribute to this transformative change that we needed. But for that uh, to happen, uh, I also think that we as a landscape architects must play several roles, not only as a designer, but also as a researcher, as a political advisor and as advocacy members. So what is the added value of coastal landscape governance to address the landscape and the climate crisis? First, and of course, strongly influenced by the European Landscape Convention and the current landscape debate, we claim that we must move beyond outstanding coastal landscapes. We claim that coastal landscape governance must apply to all coastal landscapes. Nevertheless, of their characteristics, the landscape unit concept is essential in planning and managing for addressing the climate crisis. And as landscapes are not static, we must recognize that both the biophysical and the ecological object, but also the different values that constitute a coastal landscape. And we also entail that coastal landscape governance operates on multiple scales and temporal scales, interconnecting the ecological, the social, the cultural, the aesthetic, and the sensorial values that, and that citizens and stakeholders, they must recognize and connect to them. But of course, to do so, we must move beyond political administrative boundaries because as Juan Ogue wrote, landscape units are not seen as political or administrative entities, okay? But they are living spaces. They are places for rethinking the governance of the landscape. And however, in most countries, landscape units may not have the legitimacy to operate. Uh, this also reinforced need to rethink coastal landscape governance institutions and actors, because the political recognition of the coastal landscape unity boundary will require a comprehensive and adaptive governance structure instead of a sectoral and silos perspective. So we must conduct more research to discuss, to discuss which institutions and actors should be governing the coastal landscape, approaching it from the planetary scale to the local scale. We also claim that coastal landscape governance entails landscape justice to true co-production. The landscape research debate on the global north focus on the relationship between landscape and justice, especially after the implementation uh, of the European Landscape Convention, because the convention entails the right, the right to the landscape. And landscape justice is strongly aligned with the landscape democracy debate supporting bottom-up approach where individuals are the basis of the landscape. And the discussion around landscape justice concerns with the distribution of injuries and the benefits, of course, related to the landscape, but also requires fairness of procedure and recognition of justice to ensure sustainable outcomes that improves people's quality of life. So coastal landscape governance must uh, entail climate and landscape justice through co-production, requiring an inclusive and collaborative approach to address the climate crisis and to promote justice beyond the landscape elitism. 
Landscape elitism is a concept also discussed in literature on which landscape technicians or, re or landscape researchers claim that they are the only one able to make decisions regarding the landscape. Uh, so we claim that we must favor the greater good and strive for new landscapes of reference where everyone is involved instead of pursuing elite interests. But in order to achieve that, and despite the fact that the coastal landscape governance involves a continuous process of dialogue and social consensus with the non-public actors and citizens through co-production, we also advocate that the state must govern the coastal landscape as a common and public good. Because in many coastal countries, the state has downsized its role following market ideologies and neoliberal policies, and in some cases, even privatized, privatized the stretch of the coastline. And in political economy, some authors claim that nowadays policies are evolving to pursue a valuation of nature as a paradigm of investment, uh, and we must use this concept of infrastructural nature as sites of investment and, and value extraction, okay, without, however, denaturalizing them. And if we do that, maybe we, we can create new forms of management by capital and for, for, for the state. And of course, this relation must be explored with the concept of the green infrastructure and the nature-based solutions and the, our ecosystem service, okay? Because they can serve as a, a way of, of creating new forms of management on which capital is generator and which will also allow to the state to address and to protect the common good. So I claim that the state must assume the control of the coastal landscape infrastructure in order to ensure landscape and climate justice, rather than subjecting the public goods to the priorities of the market investors. And to do that, the state must create an ambitious shared vision able to mobilize society to address climate justice for all and once again using the green infrastructure concept as a relevant instrument to identify planning and management the coastal infrastructure landscape and for that i think also that regional design must be back on the game Regional design can embrace the landscape unit concept. It can establish a planning strategy that must be coherent to develop at a regional scale, but then that can be locally developed on a project level, okay? Without losing the necessary scale that we need to include the ecological, the cultural, the social, and the aesthetic values, while reinforcing the social networks between the different stakeholders that operate on a coastal area. Also, regional design can provide also a framework for designing a coastal landscape that's, that is contextually reflective of the local identity, that is resilient, that is adaptive, and it must focus on the new concept and new ways of redistributing power, but it, the regional design must also be able to produce real future alternatives that involve a more comprehensive range of actors recognizing and reimagining the different forces of change that operate on a coastal landscape and approaching the planetary scale again with the, the more local or regional scale. And the approach to conduct a regional design strategy must be based on the landscape approach, okay, in order to pursue transformative change. And transformative change focus on the structural problems in a society. It must construct a vision for the future of a preferred outcome, and, but it also must to know how to implement them. And this requires systemic change and again, the involvement of multiple stakeholders. So we claim that coastal landscape governance should pursue transformative change through a landscape approach that consider the multiple factors that must use interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary methods that must promote long-term sustainability and resilience of the landscape and its communities, exploring its relationships with transformative governance, with adaptive governance, and also with the evolutionary governance theory. And although the scientific debate on the coastal landscape governance is unclear when governance becomes management or planning, 
uh, we think that uh, we must try that coastal landscape governance must trace its boundaries, okay, while understanding its interdependencies. And the coastal landscape governance must entail its relationship with the planning and management system, exploring the relevance of a landscape approach as a bridging concept between the governance, the planning, and the management of a coastal landscape. Okay. And it's also very relevant to research, we conducted research exploring the advantage on practice uh, when compared with integrated coastal management approach. approach. Finally, uh, on, uh, our manifesto aims to instigate a worldwide research commitment on and through coastal landscapes. However, we acknowledge the need to regional, regional, regionalize uh, coastal landscape governance because only a, a rigorous theoretical and empirical discussion built from both the global north and global south and from different interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary perspectives will be able to develop a coastal landscape governance theory that responds to the global governance challenge while also engaging with the specificities and diversities of coastal landscapes and the local communities and actors that shape them in order to build a better and more just landscape. So we also recognize that our manifesto is still an open document, okay? but it makes a clear statement uh, on our scientific intentions, but which also, it also raised several questions and several research topics that must be further explored. Therefore, we invite you also to contribute with your own perspectives and forms in, of knowledge in order to, to improve uh, the reality of our coastal landscapes. And thank you very much for your presentation, for your attention.